During the past two years, there have been attempts by ships to reach the shores of the Gaza Strip under the guise of providing humanitarian aid. Some of the ships were permitted to enter the Gaza Strip, while others were stopped. As a result of these attempts, in April 2009, senior Israeli Navy and IDF general staff orders were issued, defining the IDF's deployment arrangements for future ships. In the beginning of February 2010, initial information was received regarding a protest flotilla scheduled to sail in May aimed allegedly to break the closure on the Gaza Strip. Beginning mid-May, the Navy began making preparations to prevent the ships from reaching the Gaza Strip. Throughout the preparations, discussions were held to present the central idea, authorization plans, designated authorization plans, and the current situational picture. These presentations were held several times with the Navy, the Operations Branch, and with the Chief of the General Staff. Furthermore, the preparations included simulation training and mental preparation of the IDF soldiers. On May 12, the first General Staff Operation Plan was distributed and on the following day, May 13, the plan was authorized by the Chief of the General Staff, with the main idea being to gain control of the ships by having the soldiers board them. Upon authorizing the plans, the Chief of the General Staff stressed the importance of having a senior officer present at the anticipated friction points. At the same time as preparations for the operation were underway, the planning branch and the Navy conveyed messages to all foreign military attachés in Israel, as well as all IDF attachés overseas. On May 13, the Chief of the General Staff sent a letter to the Defense Minister and Prime Minister. In his letter, he emphasized, among other things, the need for an interministerial combined operation with the military option, including the seizure, confiscation and the arrest of the ship's activists, being the last option and lowest priority. On May 26, a final assessment of the situation was made under the leadership of the Chief of the General Staff. The operation was presented to the Defense Minister and authorized by him. Description of the Incident During the month of May 2010, eight ships sailed from Ireland, Turkey and Greece. The ships didn't dock at any ports along the way and sailed directly to a designated meeting point south of Cyprus. Several months before their departure, diplomatic attempts were made to prevent the flotilla from sailing. At the same time, courses of action were considered in the event that the flotilla would set sail. Within three days, six of the ships joined 30 miles south of Cyprus, while a Turkish warship, the Burak, was stationed to the east. At the same time, diplomatic attempts were made to prevent the flotilla's arrival at the Gaza Strip shores. In addition, continuous intelligence surveillance of the ships was carried out. Preparation of IDF Forces The forces assigned to stop the flotilla included Navy boats, helicopters, with soldiers trained to rappel down ropes, and surveillance aircraft. 
At the same time as the preparations at sea and in cooperation with various government offices, a defined site was set up at the port of Ashdod. IDF forces, police and government representatives prepared to receive hundreds of the ship's passengers. During preparations for the operation, SWAT and Masada teams were trained, as well as Israel Prison Services units. In any situation where the use of weapons is deemed necessary, the forces were instructed to act in a gradual fashion, using at first non-lethal weapons and to only use live weapons in life-threatening situations. May 30, 1627, the ship set sail. Six ships began to sail from the meeting point towards the Gaza Strip shore. The ships sailed collectively in a group structure, with only dozens to a few hundred meters separating between them. At the same time, IDF Navy forces moved towards the flotilla. From 2100 to 0041, questioning and transmitting messages to the ships. At first, messages were sent to the ships clarifying to the passengers that they are heading towards an area under naval blockade and that they will not be permitted to enter the area. Next, the IDF proposed that the ships enter the port of Ashdod and transport their goods to Gaza by land. Some of the ships replied that the Israeli Navy does not have the authority to stop them and that they are on their way to the Gaza Strip. The Sophia did not respond at all, while others responded with profanity. Mavi Marmara, you are approaching an area of hostilities, which is under a naval blockade. The Israeli government supports delivery of humanitarian supplies to the civilian population in the Gaza Strip and invites you to enter the Ashdod port, after which you can return to your home ports aboard the vessels on which you arrived. Yo, shut the fuck up. Go back to Auschwitz. Who's helping Arabs going against the U.S.? Don't forget 9-11, guys. After completing the message communication stage, the IDF force prepares and divides into several dispatches in order to enable gaining control of several ships at the same time. One group of soldiers was assigned to gain control of the Marmara, after which other dispatches were to gain control of the remaining ships. At the same time, a communications blackout and electronic signal jamming was carried out, preventing most onboard material from being released. However, short video clips and several messages were leaked from the Marmara. Due to the fact that there were several ships with a large number of passengers, the takeover took place at night, 70 to 100 miles from shore, before they reached the blocked area. 0428 beginning of the Marmara takeover. As soon as the IDF lifeboats approach the ship, IHH activists crowd together at the side of the ship. It looks like most of the people are dispersing, some of them are going to the sides, mostly towards the stern of the ship and the sides. An attempt to hoist the ladder. The soldiers try to climb on board the ship and encounter severe violence in the form of water hoses and hurling of iron pipes and chains at them, as well as using electric disc saws to cut the ladders of the IDF Special Forces Unit S-13 used in attempting to board. We're getting hit with bottles and a barrage of rocks. The lifeboats move slightly away from the ship but remain close to the side attracting the activists' attention. At the same time, authorization was given to bring in the Black Hawk helicopter according to plan. 0430, the first helicopter arrives carrying 15 soldiers. While hovering in the air and before coming down, 10 to 15 people are seen on the ship's roof. In order to ensure the safe landing of the soldiers on the deck, a number of stun grenades are thrown. As a result, the activists evacuate the center of the roof. After the first Black Hawk rope is dropped, three activists tie the rope to the deck of the ship. <laughs> the second rope is dropped and the soldiers begin to slide down. All the soldiers slide onto the roof within a minute after starting out. 
During the first few minutes, violent clashes develop on the roof. Every soldier that slides down is attacked by two to four activists using knives, iron bars and axes. The second soldier to come down was shot in the stomach by one of the activists. The soldiers who encounter a life-threatening situation are forced to use live ammunition. During the battle, five soldiers are injured from stab wounds, beatings and gunshot wounds. Three soldiers are thrown off the roof of the ship onto the deck and are taken to the hull of the ship. While falling, one of the soldiers is stabbed in the stomach and hand. 0435. The second helicopter arrives, carrying 12 soldiers. The commander of the medical squad, the fourth in command who arrived on the first helicopter, oversees treatment of the injured and locates a secure spot. The activists evacuate the center of the roof after absorbing casualties and gather in the front and back of the roof. Additional attempts to attack the force as the second helicopter approaches are met with gunfire aimed at the attacker's feet. At the same time, the lifeboats approach the ship for the second time. The soldiers realize that they are being fired at from both sides of the ship. Again, they encounter violent resistance. A soldier slides down and begins moving towards the front of the roof in order to reinforce their control. The force reaches the front of the roof and gains control of the attackers. At the same time, it secures the lower decks. At this stage, the soldiers are attacked by the activists and are forced to fire at the attacker's feet. The first attempt to go down to the lower deck is met with violent resistance, including several shooting incidents at the soldiers gaining control over the remaining ships while gaining control of the Marmara. While taking over the Marmara, Boat 8000 and the Challenger are being taken over. The combatants meet resistance on board these ships. The violent resistance is oppressed by use of crowd control tactics. 0446 Arrival of the third helicopter carrying 14 soldiers. The commander of the third helicopter joins the second helicopter commander on the ship's roof and the forces begin to move towards the bridge. As soon as they begin to descend, the soldiers are attacked and they return fire. 0504 Rushing the bridge The forces advance towards the ship's bridge. While they are moving, another attempt is made to attack the force and the force responds with fire. The forces rush the bridge and take control. At the force's command, the ship's captain instructs all activists to enter their cabins and adds that he is no longer in command of the ship. At this stage, most of the activists who were assembled on the sides of the ship go down to the ship's hull. The rubber boats approach the ship for the third time. The activists remaining on the sides of the ship continue violent resistance flinging iron pipes at the soldiers. In view of the continued violent resistance on deck and the force commander's assessment that there are a number of wounded soldiers whose condition is unknown, he orders the easing of the use of live fire, accurate and precisely targeting the violent activists, in order to enable the soldiers to climb on board the ship quickly. The sides of the ship empty quickly and the soldiers climb up from the rubber boats onto the ship. The commander of the force and the commander of special forces unit S-13 climb up from the lifeboats onto the ship and move towards the roof. When they reach the roof, an assessment of the situation is made and it turns out that three soldiers from the first helicopter team are missing. The force commander prepares to rush the passengers area in order to locate the missing soldiers. At the same time, soldiers from the roof of the boat spot the three missing soldiers who are wounded and being led by the attackers to the ship's bow. The unit opens fire with a non-lethal weapon towards the attackers who retreat into the ship, leaving the three wounded soldiers on the ship's bow. Two of the injured soldiers take advantage of the situation and jump into the water, intending to swim towards the nearby boats. They are picked up by the rubber boats. The third soldier remains unconscious on the bow. The suppressive fire unit jumps from the ship's roof to the bow and joins the wounded soldier. 
They identify the wounded soldier while a group of soldiers reaches him. 0517. End of the battle. State of affairs. The team on the roof tends to the injured. The team at the bridge controls the ship. A team in the stern of the ship and the deck control the entrances. The findings indicate that there were a number of shooting incidents by activists at Israeli soldiers. In addition, soldiers on the rubber boats identified activists shooting at them from the ship. The second soldier who came down from the helicopter was shot in the stomach by activists shortly after he reached the roof. This was probably the first shot fired on the ship. During the search, a gun was found in the ship's hull. The gun was taken from one of the wounded soldiers that was moved by the activists to the ship's hull. The gun had no bullets, despite the fact that none of the three wounded soldiers used it. Takeover of the remaining ships. After gaining control of the boat 8000 and the Challenger, while the battle continues on the Marmara, the forces continue to gain control of the three remaining ships. An additional fast rope unit lands on the Defni, while the other units take control of the Sofia and Gaza, treating the injured and evacuating them. After completing the takeover stage, the next stage was tending to the injured and evacuating them. The injured are taken up to the roof where they are treated. A total of 38 injured are evacuated by air, seven of them from our forces. Two additional injured soldiers are evacuated through the sea. During the takeover, nine S-13 commando soldiers were wounded, three seriously. The three soldiers taken to the hull of the ship witnessed an argument between activists who wanted to hurt them and several passengers who asked the activists to stop what they were doing. Nine activists were killed and 55 flotilla participants were injured, 14 of them seriously. 31 of the wounded were evacuated by helicopter and 24 were diagnosed at Ashdod port and are also sent for medical treatment. The bodies of the activists were taken to Israel on board a missile boat. 14 field surgeries were performed on board the ship. Approximately 40 helicopter evacuations of the wounded by the search and rescue 669 unit were made. By 12.30 p.m., all the wounded were evacuated to hospitals in Israel. The remaining flotilla participants are removed from their rooms onto the deck. Masada combatants and SWAT teams search them. Later, the hull of the ship is searched. During the search, an IDF gun is found without bullets. The boat's arrival at Ashdod port and completion of the naval stage of the operation. After overtaking the six ships, they are led by the Navy to Ashdod port. After questioning the flotilla participants and from intelligence gathered after the flotilla, the following pictures come into view. Forty activists, members of the IHH organization, boarded the Marmara at the port of Istanbul and were later joined by the remaining participants at the port of Anatolia. Nine of the dead were Turkish. Eight of them belonged to the IHH organization or other Islamic Turkish parties and organizations associated with the IHH. Half of those killed informed their relatives of their wish to die as martyrs. When I went first convoy, I wanted to be a shaheed. I wasn't that lucky. Third time lucky, inshallah, I'll be shaheed. There were no human rights activists among those killed. One of the casualties is a young man whose affiliation is unknown. Organization members were prepared in advance for a violent and well-covered confrontation with the IDF forces. They were prepared with iron pipes, chains, slingshots and marbles, disc saws, gas masks, bottles of tear gas, ceramic vests, Molotov cocktails, weapons sight devices, commando knives and more. In addition, non-IDF ammunition, cartridges and bullets were found on board the ship, as well as an advanced editing and broadcasting studio. The group performed preliminary briefings, putting an emphasis on assaulting IDF soldiers and preventing them from boarding the ship at any cost. <laughs> يدخل إلى السفينة 
لو دخلوا إلى سفينتنا ونحن نطردهم إلى البحر بإذن الله The organization members were divided into squads and conducted routine patrols on deck, aided by walkie-talkies and night vision equipment. The flotilla included a total of 718 passengers. According to a government decision, all passengers were released without completing their debriefing. The last passenger left Israel on June 6th.